Sarah. I'm a registered Evoke Potential technologist. Evoke Potentials, um, also known as EPs, cover a variety of testing. It is one modality within our field of neurodiagnostics. Evoke Potentials um, consist of VEPs, Visual Evoke Potentials. They also consist of somatosensory Evoke Potentials, which we call SSEPs and BEARS, uh, brainstem auditory evoked responses. Where I currently work, the technologist, the evoked potential technologist does not record the BEARS, that is done by audiologists, but there are facilities that do have the technologist record, the, the neurodiagnostic technologist record evoked uh, BEARS. Visual evoked potentials are done on patients of all ages. If they're not old enough to stare at a screen, then we use flash goggles. But if they're old enough to sit in a chair and concentrate and, and stare at a screen, then we put some electrodes on their head and we have them sit and watch a pattern reversal on a TV screen. That, is, that test is used sometimes for multiple sclerosis and other neurodiagnostic uh, or neurophysiology abnormalities. Also is somatosensory evoked potentials SSEPs and in that test we are testing for multiple sclerosis among other things and we hook up the head, we measure and mark the head, we put electrodes on and we stimulate either the ulnar nerve or the posterior tibial nerve and we measure the response in a brain, a brain wave that tells how, how much time in milliseconds it takes to go from where the stimulus site is up to the subcortical, which is um, the cervical response, and then the cortical response. The neurologist reads all of these tests. At the facility I currently work for, where I am a registered EEG technologist, which is one of the things that you can be along with an EVO potential technologist. And with that, uh, we go out on the field and we out on the floor and we do EEGs, or you can run EVO potential testing. EVO potential testing is not as common nowadays as what it was in the past. Most of the time, it's less than 100 or so cases a year of evoke potential testing. So generally, if you're an evoke potential technologist, that's not the only thing you're doing, but that's just the experience that I know of. I know there's many facets out there in the field, and it could be at a, you could work at a doctor's office or someplace where that, that's exactly, that's all you do. Generally, the shifts are Monday through Friday, and it's day shift hours, and again, it would depend on if you work at a facility or if you work at a doctor's office, what hours that is that you'll be working. A lot of times, too, an evoke potential technologist is registered in surgery. They're CNIM, which means Certified Neurophysiological Intraoperative Monitoring, or Neuromonitoring. The EP test is also performed in surgery, just a little bit different. EPs, um, in general, that I spoke about previously are clinical EPs. In surgery, these EPs are ran to monitor the brain and the spinal cord during brain surgery and spine surgery. Again, it's the same response, somatosensory evoke potentials, where you're stimulating the ulnar nerve, the posterior nerve. There could be other nerves that you need to stimulate, such as the median nerve. Also, in surgery, you'll run motor evoke potentials where you actually stimulate the motor cortex and then the response is recorded from one of the peripheral sites such as um, the arms, the legs. You're looking for a response there. Another thing in surgery we monitor is EMG. We call that SEMG, spontaneous or free running EMG, and triggered EMG. Spontaneous free-running EMG is recording the muscle responses during the surgical case. It lets the surgeon know if he's getting close to a nerve root, and you as the technologist will explain to the, to the surgeon that you've got a burst or a train, which means he's getting close to that nerve. The other thing is um, triggered EMG, and what that is is once the surgeon places screws in a pedicle, then he will generally stem the screw. 
and when he stems the screw again you're looking at the waveforms and you're letting him know if there's a response if it's uh, below 10 milliamps or above 10 milliamps so you're stimu you're sending a uh, current through the stimulator that the surgeon's holding while he's got it placed on top of that screw and you're letting him know how good uh, that screw is that it's um, well embedded into the bone and it's not breaching and affecting a nerve. The hours for surgery vary. Previously I worked for a surgical intraoperative monitoring <coughs> company where they contract, um, they contract out cases so I would travel and go to different facilities when they needed monitoring. So the days and the hours just really varied and depended. There was no set time or day or shift or anything. It's whenever you're needed. Um, the difference between that and working at a facility where I work at now, there are set days and hours I work, but when you work in surgery, again, it's still very unpredictable. Um, for instance, uh, just the other day, we were called and told that we were needed to monitor a surgical case an hour before the case was going to start. And then also, you can also get a call to go monitor a case or even have a scheduled case and then it changes at the last minute. They either don't need you or they're changing the procedure. So there, it's very unpredictable in surgery life. Um, it is very, it's a very good job, it's very rewarding, both EVO potentials and surgery, but the stress levels um, are a little bit different. When you're running clinical EPs, the stress level is not very high, but when you're working in surgery, the stress level can be e extremely high. You're working under high pressure, you're working at a fast pace, you're really trying to hurry up and get the patient set up when they come in the room. Um, you're trying to get your data reported and baseline set and it's a lot of hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Once you get the, the bulk of what you need done, then you're setting and you're waiting because the surgeon's making the incision. And then again, you're back to once he starts working, you're kind of sitting on the edge of your seat watching your waveforms again. So the stress, the stress levels are vary between the different modalities in the field. I went to a KHEP accredited program in electroneurodiagnostics technology, which was a two-year program. And by going to that program, I received my associates in applied science for electroneurodiagnostics technology. By graduating from a KHEP accredited program, I was able to take the board registry exam that ABRA offers for evoke potentials. I am also registered in EEG and a lot of times EVO potential technologists will also have another registry, whether it be EEG or the CNIM or even um, nerve conductions. With the EP registry, it enables you to get an increase in pay when facilities will offer for more than one registry if you have another registry. I also feel personally that it helps you if you are interested in surgery in obtaining that CNIM, um, the Certified Neuro Interoperative Monitoring Registry Board Exam. So in order to take the EP board exam, they look for you being a graduate from a KHEP accredited program, but also for the CNIM, not only do you need to have a registry in another field such as EEG or EP, and the graduate from a KHEP accredited program. You could also take PATH 2, which is a bachelor's degree, and then you have to, either way, log 150 cases, no matter which, which path you're taking. But the PATH 2, you take 250 question exam, written exam, and PATH 1, if that, that's a graduate from a program such as me and with other registries, then you take a 200 question written exam. I feel that the schooling prepares you for this and I highly recommend anyone going to a KHEP accredited program. It does not have to be a two year associates in applied science. It could also, there are programs out there and if you go to assetaset.org, our American Society, there's a list of schools and programs for the different modalities. And there are some programs that only last approximately 
approximately a year and those are certificate programs. They are still KHEP accredited so that it still allows you to take the written board exam through ABRET for whichever modality you choose. The nice thing about the electroneurodiagnostic technology programs is there's not a lot of math, so if your math's not your favorite subject, then that's a good thing. Um, again, there's not a lot of sciences. Um, my program was an associate's in applied science, so there was um, your general bio and chemistry, biology, chemistry, and then anatomy and physiology one and two. I would say the best part about the job being in the neurodiagnostic field is one, there's several registries you can get. I am uh, quadruple boarded. I am registered in EEG and evoke potentials in PSG polysomnography, which is sleep, and also in CNIM, the surgical registry. So I believe in our field that it's very nice that you can get any of those registries. There's one more registry that's available is long-term monitoring and then of course nerve conduction. So actually there, there's six registries altogether. The potential in the field, there's, there's lots of jobs. Um, there's not a waiting list for school. Um, you, there's literally a shortage of techs all over the country. And what's nice about our registries is unlike nursing or x-ray, where our registry carries across the country and is not licensed per state. So I, I believe that's very beneficial. The pay is good. Um, you can pretty much live wherever you want in this country. You can transfer. There's traveling jobs. There's hospital jobs. There's doctor's office jobs. Um, it's pretty much the sky's the limit in this field and it's wherever it wants to take you or wherever you want to want to take, take it. I know I have colleagues that own their own businesses and teach board prep classes or that have their own businesses doing the contract in intraoperative monitoring or EEG contract work where they travel or they work for a, a contracting company that sends them out traveling. So again, um, and even facility-wise, there's small facilities where you could do a few tests a day and there's larger facilities that are currently where I work, a level one trauma facility, that you, you can do several types of testing, several uh, tests a day, up to 23 EEGs a day, and we offer all of the testing. I have a, a strong passion for the field, so it's hard for me to find a worse part for me personally, but I guess the worst part of the field would be if you're starting out in sleep and you're a person with a family and you want and you want day shift and you have to start out night shift because generally the sleep studies are at night. Um, another worst part could be if you live in a small area and you're not willing to relocate and the jobs that are offered in your area are small hospital jobs um, where you don't have that variety or they're in, in a doctor's office or maybe even um, there's not a lot of testing available in your area. So that could be a worse part of the job. Again, my final advice to someone that's interested in this job is to do research on it like you would anything else. Um, you can Google it, you can go to asset.org, you can go to abret.org, um, look up what you're interested in. Maybe you want to do all of the modalities, maybe you only want to do one or two. Um, also, you could uh, go online and look under medhunters.com, Yahoo Hot Jobs, look and see what jobs are out there before you invest your time and your money into going to school for this. I personally don't think you would regret it, but you never know, everybody's different. Once you go on there and you see that there's jobs all over, um, the Department of Labor and Bureau just listed us um, because we're such a shortage of, there's such a shortage of text, they just listed us as a bright outlook um, under the Labor and Bureau for jobs. So that's really important to us in the field and we're really proud of that, that we're listed on there, we're being recognized, we're such a small field 
that that's hard sometimes to get recognition. A lot of people get us confused with EKG or they don't understand unless they've had a patient, a family member that needed testing. Um, then a lot of times people don't know anything about our field. All they hear about is nursing or x-ray and, and nothing's wrong with those areas. But again, there's, there's so much opportunity in this field and it's sad that not a lot of people know about it. There's a variety of different societies you can get involved with at the state level or at the um, national level. And I think that's very important. Networking, because we are a small field. Networking, I highly suggest for every student, every um, person, technologist working in the field, whether they're registered or not, going to conferences and going to society meetings and networking and meeting other people because you'll find out about other jobs that's out there and you can also find out lots of um, new ways to do testing or uh, better ways.